Good afternoon and good evening to everyone on the call. I'm very much looking forward to the exciting event we have today in Connected Mobility and Data Marketplace. Um, first of all, I'd like to do a quick introduction of uh, the CBA. Um, and be before I start that, a little quick introduction of myself. I'm Kevin Lally, uh, Vice President of the Board of Directors um, for the last two years in the CBA. And before that, I was the Executive Director of the, the CBA. Um, the Crypto Valley Association uh, predominantly focuses itself on the support and adopt adoption of uh, blockchain use cases uh, throughout the country of Switzerland and builds bridges to international locations. For example, like um, Mobi that we have um, co-hosted the event today with. Uh, I also want to make a, a brief thank you to the Blockchain Center and University of Zurich and also Cardano that we um, co-host the event with here today. Thank you very much for your participation. Um, I also wish to uh, make a very brief thank you to the participants from the SBB Swiss Federal Railway, Swiss Re themselves, Mobi of course, Bosch, and uh, the Cardano Foundation, as well as the University of uh, Southern California, as well as Cardossier. Um, I will just cover briefly that the number of active working groups that we have in relation to um, where the focus working groups are in the CBA. We have an investor working group. We have uh, the startup working group. We also have the regulatory um, working group that is focused on um, legal and uh, interfacing with the Swiss financial regulator FINMA predominantly, as well as addressing the, um, the open um, progress around the Open VASP initiative, for instance, in the FATF. Uh, we also have a tax uh, working group and uh, to cap it off, we have, uh, of course, the enterprise blockchain and the cybersecurity working group. With that brief, um, I wish to again, welcome everyone to the call, wish everyone an um, informative meeting, looking forward to it very much. And thank you again for joining on behalf of the board of the CVA. Have a very nice event. Back to you, Dennis. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, it's now up to me to thank as well all the participants and uh, especially as well our sponsors, um, uh, the University of uh, Zurich and the Cardano Foundation uh, for making this uh, e event together with Mobi and the Crypto Valley Association uh, possible. Uh, my name is Dennis Flass. I'm the chairperson of the Enterprise uh, Working Group, co-chairing it together with Mauro, who will be our Master of Ceremony uh, tonight and take us through the uh, event. I'm then heading later on the panel with my good panelists. Yeah, the Enterprise uh, Blockchain Working Group, what's our objective within, within the Crypto Valley Association? And um, yeah, I mean, I see that we have at the moment a little bit uh, a, a big discussion about uh, platform economy. Uh, that is the big buzzword uh, out there. And I think it's a, it is a future business model where a lot of uh, uh, eco ecosystems are moving towards. Um, but we have two worlds there. We have on one side the more centralized models uh, that we know from large tech uh, giants, uh, uh, especially as well from the from the Silicon Valley. Later, a little bit on that one. Um, and on the other side, we have of course the, the decentralized uh, networks uh, building on decentralized cryptographic technology and uh, and bl uh, blockchain technology. And our aim at the working group is of course to identify success factors that make decentralized networks uh, uh, more successful because we strongly believe that this leads in the, in, the, in, the, in the long run to more market efficient solutions. And when you saw lately the discussions about uh, competition law uh, threats from uh, Google uh, in, the, in the US uh, Senate and, and Congress at the moment, or what the European Union is as well doing, I think there is a fair statement that we have to take care about market efficiencies in the future. And um, what we do is we do events like this. We as well work on white papers, which I'm very glad that we hopefully before Christmas can launch a, a quite large ones that we elaborated in the working group. And we support universities and students um, and enterprises to come together to do uh, research uh, on the topic of enterprise blockchain solutions. So that's what we do. And I'm very glad now to hand over to Mauro to introduce our first speakers. Thank you, Dennis. Um, yes, we have the first uh, 
um, speaker, which is Eva Oberholzer. She is the Chief Growth uh, Officer at Cardano. Um, obviously, she's going to present us about how we can monetize data in the future. And I think you have a special focus on the Asia market. So, you know, um, just for the information for everybody, we're going to have questions at the end after the three speakers. Uh, Eva, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. I think we're going to see some slides soon, right? Yes, exactly. <laughs> you have to share. Yes. Do you see something? We we don't at this point. Um, maybe it takes a moment to kind of switch. Okay. I think you should have the right yeah. to do that. Somehow, <laughs> I'm so sorry. Okay. But... It's not popping up. So maybe, <laughs> I'm not really good in multiple. Let me quickly check <laughs> if anybody else has the slides. Does anybody? Uh, I don't think so. Um, Ever, I will send you an email quickly and you can send it to me and I can uh, put it on the screen. Uh, Mauro, maybe then we can have Trem or Evangelos um, go first. Yes, please. And then <laughs> so. you can have Evo second. Yes. Okay, good. Um, then, yes, let's, um, let's have the second speaker, Trem. Um, you're the co-founder and CEO of Mobi, right? You have been in the space for quite a while. I think, you know, what's interesting to us in this session, we're not just talking about financial industry this time. We're talking about different technologies coming to bed together and monetizing that. So, uh, Tram, the floor is yours. Uh, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Um, I think you should see my screen now, correct? Uh, yes, we do. Okay, good. <laughs> Um, so uh, thank you, uh, and it's, it's been great uh, organizing this event with the uh, CVA, and thank you Cardano for sponsoring our event. Uh, for the next 10 to 15 minutes or so, I will talk about Mobi Currents technology um, and, and future technology uh, initiatives uh, that we are calling the Mobi technology set. Um, we started working on the ecosystem uh, for the what we call the minimum viable community uh, in early 2015. And uh, three years later, in May 2018, uh, we launched with 35 founding members. And now we have a hundred and growing. Um, we are working with our standards, um, <clears throat> our members to create standards and digital ways to identify all things mobility, including transactions. And Mobi itself uh, is important to note that we are technology and ledger agnostic. Why are we creating standards? Um, well, before um, adoption of any revolutionary technology, industries need standards um, to uh, give specs and to build the foundational infrastructure so that uh, we can create products and services that can communicate and work together. Why is the uh, Mobi community uh, the right place to start uh, and create these standards? Uh, well, cumulatively, uh, the community has upwards to 15% of global GDP. Uh, we have over 100 years of trusted partnerships with cities and government and consumers. Um, and we have the ability to assign digital twins, the ability to install secure wallet at manufacture, and the ability to build payment channels uh, for the ecosystem. Mobi currently has um, six working groups. The first one had, of course, to be uh, vehicle ID, and that one um, launched our first standard last year. The second vehicle ID working group uh, just finished discussion this year, 
and now it's drafting the second standard. So essentially the first vehicle ID standard was for the birth of the vehicle. And now uh, BID2 is, is writing a standard on what happened to the vehicle uh, from birth uh, uh, to grave. And the usage-based insurance um, has drafted a standard and now it's being reviewed by the working group members. Um, electric vehicle grid integration, EVGI, uh, we uh, pushed out our standard last month and now it's being reviewed by the community. Uh, connected mobility data marketplace, uh, we have uh, concluded discussion and now we're in the process of drafting the standard. And the two working groups that we launched this year, the first one was supply chain, is going through technical requirements definition. And the standard for that um, is uh, from, from materials to parts and parts ID. And when we have that standard, it will be connected to our vehicle ID. And the last uh, working group we launched so far is finance securitization and smart contract. And we are going through business requirement definition uh, for that. Uh, <clears throat> although we are a blockchain-based standard, uh, uh, producing blockchain-based standards uh, for the ecosystem, uh, we don't see ourselves as a blockchain organization. Uh, we see ourselves as a community project. Uh, blockchain is not a standalone technology. Uh, the convergence of these technologies that you see uh, on the screen here together with blockchain will give anything a secure identity, be intelligent, uh, and securely interact and transact with each other. Uh, and these capabilities will define the future of mobility and how we consume mobility. Uh, we build an ecosystem uh, to, for what we call the new economy of movement, uh, which we believe to be a multi-trillion dollar opportunity for connected mobility and infrastructure, uh, exchanging data and payments seamlessly. Um, no matter how good the standards are, at the end of the day, they are just pieces of paper with writing on them. Uh, they need to be adopted and implemented uh, to create impactful outcomes for the ecosystem. And to do that, uh, we have started two more initiatives. Uh, one is the Open Mobility uh, Network, which is the OMN. And then the second one is Setopia Application Marketplace Platform. <clears throat> this is a very simple architecture overview for the MTS. Uh, so the MOVI standards, the OMN, and Citopia are the three distinct layers of the full stack for the MTS. And here is a more detailed architecture for the MTS. Uh, on the left um, is MOVI working groups working to create standards. And the standards uh, themselves will determine what kind of data and core services are available to the OMN. So what the OMN is essentially is a protocol agnostic business-to-business uh, -business network uh, that enables all the stakeholders uh, participating to share, exchange, and monetize uh, mobility and transit data. Um, and the share core services uh, that we come up with for the OMN will allow all the applications sitting on top of it uh, to be able to communicate and talk to each other. So instead of getting apples and oranges, we'll get apples and apples. And the Citopia Marketplace uh, platform built um, uh, on the top of the OMN, uh, which is on the right side of your screen here, um, is built on blockchain to en enable a very important feature, which is data privacy. Um, existing marketplaces out there, uh, as mentioned by Dennis, is built on current technology with very similar business models to scrape and monetize data from their users. <clears throat> and Mobi has over 100 members and counting, and most of our members are uh, competitors. Uh, therefore, we need to provide a, uh, a platform, Citopia platform, so that all the members can come and do business and retain their business models and the customers and not worried about being, uh, being poached. And to bridge the members to our Mobi, uh, um, to the mobility consumers, uh, we want the consumers to have just one app instead of download, downloading 100 apps from 100 members in our ecosystem uh, to do business with us. So Citopia gives the consumer what they want and expect uh, based on research, which is a seamless experience on one platform. 
um, in the blue boxes at the bottom of the screen right now are the different use cases that are being explored by each of the working group. And these use cases will uh, produce standards that determine what data and core services are available in the open mobility network. Um, here is a full stack example for usage-based insurance. Uh, the MOBI UBI standard covers the major insurance use cases. And then from the standard trusted and permission data, uh, for example, such as identity or driving history is available to the OMN participants. And then insurance carriers participating uh, in the OMN, for example, the ones listed here on the left side of the screen, uh, can use the data and core services uh, uh, available to them uh, to offer usage-based products to consumers like Uber drivers, uh, car rentals, and so on through their own dApps. Uh, the platform itself has a similar look and feel to, uh, to all the map-centric apps out there. Uh, and cities and government uh, can use this also to encourage green mobility and green behavior. Uh, for example, uh, during uh, traffic congestion, cities can offer incentives uh, for the drivers to take a different route <clears throat> or not get into the car at all. Uh, recently, the city of Los Angeles issued a study where uh, around 70% of people in the cars during rush hours are actually not going to and from work. Uh, so if they can give them incentives not to get in the car at all, uh, that would be a great uh, of the of the traffic congestion. Um, and then the city can also give other incentives like walking to your favorite restaurant for dinner instead of driving. And the, the incentives given by the city um, can be traded in for other services that's offered by the city. Um, Zootopia is a tokenized um, <clears throat> ecosystem. So where mobility asset owners, um, the, the ones at the bottom of the hourglass here can be connected to the consumers at the top of the hourglass uh, through a single payment platform. And at a high level, uh, there are three components to this ecosystem as well. And there is the marketplace, uh, which order, offers data privacy. Uh, therefore, competing mobility players can conjugate uh, and the user can come and, and consume uh, mobility services without worrying about data uh, being poached. And <clears throat> The second component is a utility stable token uh, to facilitate transactions with low friction. And there is the community uh, to create, adopt, and implement standards. We've been doing this for a while, and uh, this year has been very encouraging uh, to see governments around the world uh, launching more and more blockchain and mobility initiatives. Uh, in the US, for the first time, the US Department of Transportation requested proposal for blockchain application and mobility. Um, there were 122 uh, proposals and uh, the award went to uh, four university with research uh, labs. And all the light blue states that you see on the screen right now, those are part of a initiative called uh, road, road Usage Charge West, RUC West, uh, and those state uh, this summer receive a first um, award by the U.S. Uh, Department of Transportation uh, to start doing experiment in blockchain application uh, for road usage charge. And the EU Commission this summer asked Mobi along with two um, other organizations uh, to present internally to them what do we all think the first use cases uh, will be for what they call it programmable money, a machine to machine payment. And it was encouraging to see that um, the other two organizations along with Mobi all think that uh, mobility will have the first use cases. And Ava will talk um, uh, more about Asia, um, but Asia has uh, actually has a lot of initiatives coming up. Uh, for example, South Korea uh, was the first country to announce uh, that their highways will uh, have blockchain power uh, toll payments. And in May, um, South Korea also launched an, an initiative issuing blockchain driver license. Um, and by August, 
a million uh, of their citizens have opt in for this driver license. Um, and they are also working with Japan and New Zealand to pilot road usage charge. Uh, and uh, Japan is looking into issuing digitized driver license. And um, it's also worth noting that uh, in July, China issued a white paper, the government issued a white paper on um, smart city initiatives using blockchain. Uh, and one of the large component, of course, is mobility and smart city. Tram, fantastic timing. Fantastic Thank timing. You. Uh, Good. Uh, so if you want to learn more about Mobi, please go visit our website uh, and, and follow us on social media. Thank you, Tram. Uh, we got two questions that we're going to discuss later, uh, but uh, I'm going to post them to you so you can start thinking about it. They're very uh, sophisticated, standard uh, oriented. Uh, you get them on our chat. Now, uh, as next, we will continue with Evangelos. Uh, he is the head of digital ecosystems at Swiss Re, um, thought leader and advisor uh, in the um, insurance industry. So we're very interested to hear uh, how uh, you guys are going, making use of uh, IoT, AI and blockchain in your space. Very good. So. Hopefully everything works perfectly. You can see my screen, let me know. And well, yeah. you can hear me as well. We can, yes. Oh, perfectly, perfect. So I'm not gonna talk too much about what we do, how we do it, rather than what, what really matters to consumers. So I won't talk too much about um, insurance. I will talk about uh, from consumer side, what will be important. So let's see about how we're going to change or how the mobility might, uh, might, might change in the future. And um, so if you think about how did you lately consume mobility and how you might consume mobility in the future. So there will be still some traffic, some public traffic, uh, transportation, sorry. There will be still some shared mobility. There will be still everything else that is here already. So nothing new, but there will be some new mobility types or new mobility models or business models. And the interesting part of that would be to think about um, how does also micro mobility change for the time being, this is what we see in the streets, but you can imagine that new models are going to be introduced something like this here from Toyota or uh, sorry, this one here will be from Toyota here. Uh, so this micro mobility space will dramatically change, I would say, over time, because the need, the, the jobs to be done will not disappear. It's the other way around. People want to go as fast as possible from A to B. So we will see some new models. And the question is, finally, considering all the mobility needs, um, what will it be about? It will be about the mobility customer. And the question is on, on, on the mobility customer. So what's gonna be so important from a customer point of view? So imagine that you have today's different apps you might using in. Some of them are really very cool to use. Some of them are really very, very hard to use. And um, we as an insurance industry, we are not very, very good at, let's say the customer experience on, on the mobile phone so far. So in the very end, I would say it will be about a seamless customer experience. So the customer will really, really demand that. And this is what we just uh, have discussed just in the previous presentation, but think about what is there in the market. So everybody's using Uber apps and everybody's using the Lyft app. Problem with that, there's almost no differentiation. And if you go to different markets like in China or you go to, to India, all of them have a very, very, very similar business model. And the question is, if new entrants are entering the markets, then you need to get started differentiating. And differentiating means you cannot do it the same way like everybody else. Otherwise, the price will just decrease dramatically. So the question is, how can you differentiate? And the question is also, if you need to differentiate on an interface, how are going to do that? Just two examples. One is the Uber example where you have different kinds of transport and 
they started with the urban air mobility on the left hand side on the right hand side you see the micro mobility areas and in the middle this is what is known if you go to other marketplaces like southeast asia then there's another competitor so grab just bought a couple of years ago uber and you see there are new types of mobility which which could be interesting like grab family here or grab pet so you can ride your pet on the same thing so there are much more kind of products being offered on that and the question is who will be able to fulfill actually many 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 needs here so uber as i chose before investing in many many other types of transport and there are other players in the markets doing exactly the same thing like gotcha here in the us or now we have collaboration on the left hand side from bmw and mercedes because part of the pie is about being in direct relationship with the customer and exactly the same thing happens on the right hand side, like Toyota's thinking about how do they need to develop the business model in order to stay relevant, in order to be in direct interaction with the customers. So we will see new players getting into the market and try to get as much as possible from actually for the, for, for the customers in order to serve actually different services. This is a product driven new, right? So we have different types of transport that we are being offered, hopefully in a very seamlessly way. So if you consider my journey, my journey uh, on a daily commute could look like that. So I will get my subscription service going to the next train station, get the train, perhaps then I need to share a bike. And then in the afternoon I might get a kind of Uber drive in the evening when I go back home, I take another kind of e-scooter, go to the train station again, and then go back home again. So the question is, if I want to do that, how many apps do I need? And the obvious answer of that, I need a lot. So only to manage in this kind of journey, I will need about five to six apps doing that simultaneously. And is this the customer center view? No, it's not. Of course, there are other solutions. And this is a question, uh, how many apps do you want to have? We just heard it before, the single app that will kill actually all this, um, that will offer actually all these um, uh, solutions integrated. Let's see how this is going to work out. So think about if you go into the micromobility space where you have different participants already in the market. And the question is, do you want to download all the apps here? And of, sure, of course, you don't want to do that. And there's already an app transit app doing exactly, exactly that, integrating different services into a single app. Does this exist here in Zurich? No, it doesn't, not yet. But you will start thinking, how can I integrate other types of transfers? And uh, of course, you know, WIM that is integrating a multimodal view. However, you know, this is on, on a subscription basis. So it's not an on-demand thing. It's a kind of mixed thing. It goes to the right direction. That's exactly the way it should be, but think about further. So this is again Southeast Asia. This is the killer app from Southeast Asia called Grab. And you don't see only mobility services. So you see the car bikes here, that's correct. But then you have uh, hotels and videos and e-scooters and everything around that. And there's another competitor, actually not a mobility provider. It's another super killer app. So you have a super ecosystem competing another super ecosystem. So we're not going to talk here only about mobility. We're going to talk about consumer needs, where mobility is just one part of it. And only to show it, mobility is one of the killer features here, but also the other one, like the trip planner, like I showed you before. So the kind of customer interface will play a fundamental role. And this is why you might only need one app actually managing that one. But think further. What will happen, as an example, if Google or another player has so much trust to the customer that he knows where the consumer is going? Perhaps you might have access to the calendar. Perhaps you might have access to other kind of insights, contextual insights. How come if a provider could actually contextualize your mobility journey and offer the products that are matching to your mobility needs? immediately. So this means that your behavior is being tracked, but also in a prescriptive way in order the products being solved or offered. Also the mobility products have been offered seamlessly. So you don't need to think about um, to get access to an app. 
this is going to be handled actually in the back end, on the background for you. So think about you have a smart assistant that has access actually to your next kind of next best action, which is a meeting somewhere else, or in the evening you might go back home and they know exactly the, so they arrange actually the services for you where the contextual behavior insights are driving the marketplaces. So we turn the market around. This does not exist yet, I know, but it's just a matter of time until you get enough trust and you change the business model around that the consumer is actually not thinking about which is the best service that the assistant is doing that for him in the background for him. And you don't need to care about any, any things in addition. This will create a kind of new competitive landscape. So the competitive landscape between openness, this is on the, um, on the horizontal axis and the personalization of products or on the journeys, this is on the vertical axis. And if I try to map here different, uh, different players in the market, you will see on the bottom left, these are more the classical OEMs that of course want to go towards the top right, as I was showing before, or you go from a, this is a red bar on the right hand side, right top, where you have the Google assistance or the kind of behavior insights provider that can map you what is actually relevant for you and they will do everything that on the back end. This does not exist yet, I know, but Grab is there, GoCheck is there and other um, ecosystems, especially in Asia or in, a, in China are existing already. So there will be a kind of new competition that, that we have not seen so far and the integration of services will be the killer thing in the very end. So think about if everybody can now finally create mobility services. Think about if everybody can create banks and think about if everybody can create, you know, insurance products. What will happen then to the competition? If everything gets commoditized, you need to differentiate. And how are you going to need to differentiate? Again, how many apps do you want to have on your mobile phone that are start caring for you? And by caring, I mean, they need to deliver a service like the augmented reality of the VR or augmented reality here, where you are on a micro mobility trip and it tells you actually where the next station is and what you need to do next and so forth and so on. So you need to integrate a best customer experience in order to stay relevant. So the product side will not be really the differentiator. It will be the customer experience that makes the race. And the question is, how are you going to drive a relationship with the consumer in order to stay relevant? This is why the consumer interface will make the difference in the future. And this is my last chart. We all have started from a digital product, a digital service. This might go into a digital platform like the Ubers, the DDs in this world, what we have seen so far, but this will not go, uh, this, not, this is not going to be enough. We'll see digital ecosystems that are, have a holistic customer driven view that are there and that are going to be stay relevant because they want to deliver best in class customer experiences in order to fulfill their needs. Thank you, thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Devangelos. Um, that was very interesting, and I think uh, we, you know, you've picked up a lot of things which are happening uh, in Asia too, right? I think a couple of these providers are very Asia, are coming out of Asia, which kind of leads us to the uh, to Eva, which we had uh, initially. I think Eva, you're now ready uh, to share your slides. Thanks a lot, Devangelos. Yeah, we're going to take questions at the end. Eva, you there? Hello. Yes. Okay, great. Good. So um, does it work with sharing now? I hope so. And otherwise we have a backup. Let me try. That's very good. All right. Yep. Nothing is happening. Good. Very good. Is it? Yes, fantastic. If you if you go full screen, then we can see it even better. I am on full screen. <laughs> um, okay, it still looks a little bit. Wait a second. We should have test, tested that. Yeah, no, not the full screen. More presentation mode. I think what do you need to go? 
Yeah. On my PowerPoint slide, I guess, right? Yes, down, down on the right. Yes, that's perfect. Do you see it now? Uh, we see that you have pressed the button. We're just waiting for it to happen. Okay. Or do you have two screens, maybe? Because I don't see the screen anymore. It's just my presentation. That's why you have to guide me through. Yeah, yeah. So maybe we can only see the small thing. Maybe what they suggest is to just increase the size on the right, on the right where you are right now, uh, on the bottom to higher percentage. And then I think we should be able to deal with it. Oh. Yes, that was a little bit too much. Just where you see click add notes, can you pull that down all the way down? There's a bar above click add notes. You can move that to the bottom. And you can also close on the right side that little X next to format background. Yeah. X. On the right, yeah. Yes. Top right, where it says format background on the right side, you can kind of click that away. That gives you a little bit more space. Is it working? No. Uh, yeah, almost. You just, yes. It's weird that the, the presentation mode is not working. Yeah. If you make it a tiny smaller, then I think we're good. Like this? A little bit more. Uh, yeah, let's go with that. Let's go with okay, that. Sorry. Okay, so Please. yeah, so Eva, you're gonna introduce, give us more some insight how to monetize data. Exactly. So uh, that was actually the perfect introduction um, <laughs> where we talked about digital ecosystem, and I probably go one step further and talk about digital and decentralized ecosystem. Since we at Cardano, we are a blockchain project, um, as you might know. And um, I'm very happy that Tram actually mentioned what's, what's going on in Asia. I also um, won't focus too much on Asia because I think what is really valuable for you to know or the valuable insights I can bring to you is really from a tech perspective. And don't worry, I'm, I'm not a tech person or not a, a programmer. But um, um, I will just show you what the status there is and what are now the, the next steps we can do. Where do we stand and what are the next steps and the big, big things that are happening? And we already work with uh, a lot of governments um, together to get actually their government and in the next step, their city smarter. And I think that's probably the, the, the valuable insight I can give you. Um, when we talk about data monetization, um, I think it's important that we first look at, at the entire ecosystem and what is needed. And therefore, I quickly want to give you um, a short introduction of what is what Cardano is. Um, I was to bring a new standard into it. Um, we want to challenge the old and active um, new age and come up with a sustainable and global distributed innovation across the world. So what does that mean? We are a third generation proof of stake blockchain network, which is now developed into a DEP uh, development, a decentralized app devel um, development platform with a multi-asset ledger and ver verifiable smart contracts. And I won't go into details, but this is for the techies that really want to understand where we now stand. Um, what is important is that we aim to be leading in scalability, interoperability, and sustainability. And one important aspect is that we prove of stake. Um, and this is also why we call ourselves a third generation blockchain. Um, because um, before we had Bitcoin, we had Ethereum. They were both on proof of work with a very um, cumbersome processes. And we actually moved to, to, to a new era. So um, what are the entities between Cardano? We have three main entities. One is the developer company, um, IOHK. Uh, then we have the foundation, which I, in which I work for. And then we have a Morgo who drives um, the, the, the commercial adoption, let's say. And um, what one of the, the 
very important aspects of the protocol's design is that it's geared toward protecting privacy rights um, and also taking into account the need of, of regulation. The leads um, or, or the requirements that regulators are now um, publishing, especially like the travel rule, etc., for those who, who are more in the blockchain um, sphere. So this is this gives me a bit the perfect introduction into the the topic data monetization and um, and the future, not only of mobility but of, of trusted ecosystems. Um, which actually lets me start, or before we talk about data monetization, I think it's important that people um, understand what it takes to get there. So what is needed to get to data, um, data monetization. So where are we at the moment? As a consumer, our digital interactions are owned and controlled by others. Um, so today, if I'm a consumer, our data, um, for example, I sign up with Amazon or any kind of platform. I give them my personal information, which they store in their database. And some, in some cases, they even monetize on it. Um, and this actually creates a honeypot for, for hackers um, because they can have only one platform and they basically get access to all of your information, but also the information of, of other people. So um, the, the major issues are the identity threat, uh, theft, data breaches, data harvesting, fragmentation, and the user experience is really bad. And I will come to that. Um, from a business point of view, um, we can flip the model over and look at the business side. So businesses face significant risk, high costs to secure personal data. Um, because they need extensive and expensive resources to secure the private and personal data of all their clients. That means they have high compliance costs, the data security costs um, are immense, fraud costs, customer trusts, and also they have to, to provide their customers with a good user experience, which is quite, quite tough. Um, and this is why we currently see a trend that enterprises and businesses are designing serverless application and go into cloud solutions. Um, what does this mean in this entire evolution phase? Uh, in, in evolution space, as I mentioned, we have um, we have different phases that will bring us to data monetization. But before we get there, I think we we have to. We saw now um, that the ecosystem how it is. We saw that phase one is actually marked by a decentralized externally controlled identity, which means we have sort of a decentralized identity where your data is stored and on many different platform. And the biggest challenge for yourself is actually to the user experience. You have to maintain about 30 to 40 accounts. Um, you showed the app before. So which app you choose for every app, you have a different password. Um, so that's really cumbersome and, and, um, and super um super complicated as a consumer so what we saw uh or what we see today and i think those phases go a bit hand in hand we see a phase two which is actually a federated identity and an identity that uh, our data that is gathered by google and facebook um and they actually um they they actually save solve the pain point so that you can log in almost everywhere with the same account which is from a user experience perspective, um, it delivers a better experience, but however, this comes with the cost of, you, of your privacy. And you actually share with them all your data, which basically means your life. They know where you walk, they know what you do, they have the full record of, of anything, um, which is from a, from, a, from a client perspective, probably also not the, not the thing you want. So, and um, what we currently see is that we are entering a decentralized um, self-sovereign identity environment. Um, what does that mean? A decentralized identity or an identity you can manage by yourself, that's a system um, or let's say it's, it's actually the next step and, and this is where blockchain kicks in, which tries to keep the user experience exactly the same than in phase two with Google and Facebook. 
Um, but what changes is that the, the data is stored or your digital identity is stored um, decentralized. So um, it allows you to protect your data and privacy in owning and therefore controlling the amount of data you share, the duration, and in the future, even the price um, of your data, which brings us to then the fourth part of the data monetization. Um, so what is the driver of this new paradigm? paradigm? Um, I mentioned blockchain. Why can we now leverage in such a technology such as blockchain? Um, the traditional identity system of today, is, as mentioned, they are fragmented, they are insecure, and they are exclusive. You um, Actually, you needed kind of a center, a central entity which manages and secures your data. Um, blockchain now enables more secure management and storage of, of digital identities by providing a unified, interoperable, and temporal infrastructure, which is a key benefit not only to users but also enterprises and which um, boosts the entire IoT space which we which we believe um, so the the main characteristics I don't want to go into detail what blockchain can do or not because I think we are quite a an advanced um, or, or we are quite advanced in, in knowing um, in knowing the 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 advancement but um the most i think from a from a user point of view i think it's censorship resistant that is important to mention um because blockchain infrastructure is run by everyone um and it's not run by a central party and it's resistant to platforms so if platforms get hacked or face sanctions from a government your data is still safe that brings us actually to the topic of the smart cities um what does it mean empowering an econo a new economy of trust? Uh, when you talk about smart cities, there are di different models, a few different ways to look at um, the definitions. But I think um, what we all agree on the notion of is of the, on the notion of a city with autonomous and connected operations, which handle handles different aspects of your urban life and um, also actually are driven by a widespread use of information and communications technology. Um, this technology is essential um, or this will be essential to, to actually drive economic value and give um, access to or give an entire new access uh, network experience. Um, but in order for that framework to develop, its, it's, um, its participants have to work closely to better embracing the new information and communication technologies. In the case of a smart city, there are three main categories um, of participants in this new economy of trust. So on the one hand, we have the government. On the other hand, we have the citizen, which is, is at the same time um, the user. And the third parties are the businesses, the organizations, and the service provider who actually can then also build on that ecosystem and provide um, further services and um, application or even decentralized applications, um, if, if so on. And um, I think this, from a tech perspective, we are actually quite close to that um, development. And um, I can say that because we, by ourselves, we have actually our, our um, the one partner in our ecosystem, IOHK, who's actually building, who's, who's building the entire technology around um, Cardano. They also have um, launched Atala Prism. Atala Prism is actually really an, uh, an, um, a tool are um, a provider for digital identity. And um, how do I, or not even a digital identity, it, it's, it's actually a decentralized identity. And therefore, the first thing that is now needed from a tech perspective in order to, to bring design, to, to launch this entire ecosystem or to make your, your data um, monetizable is um, a so-called decentralized identifier. So um, the simplest way to think of this decentralized um, identifier is um, 
It's a secure backup and restore. You have all your credentials that are issued and stored on your device and secured by biometrics. So you have a known device where your entire data is stored and only you can access this with, with, your, with your biometrics, for, for example. At the same time, there is this so-called secured wall that holds um, the encrypted credential from your decentralized identifier. So that means all your data is, um, is encrypted and basically available, but only you can decide who can access it via your decentralized identifier. Otherwise, it's just pure pure key and, and, and signs that you, you cannot really um, decrypt, um, decrypt the, the, the information. And this encrypted data store can live within the cloud or can be hosted on Amazon or can be hosted or on, on anything. That doesn't matter. So it's not even necessary that you have all your data at your at your device, it's actually really, it's on the blockchain and um, and it's divided amongst all the, or the participants or the one that are interested in using your data, they, you, they have to come to you or um, they actually have to, you have to give them permission um, that they can access your profile and content you've created. For example, you, I don't know, you, you're a writer or you're a musician, um, you can then actually give rights out or decide to whom you give your rights with what price um, and define what what the terms are of, of your license or from or for handling out this data. So this is actually the next step and this is when then really the monetization of data kicks in. But this will take a while. I think um, what is important to, to see and to know is that we need this entire ecosystem, we need this entire um, network to be um, on the blockchain or to use actually um, this this um, digital identity. And um, we also work together. We have a, a, a pilot project, a pilot market we are now testing. It's the Georgian government. So it's uh, Eurasia, <laughs> but that's probably the strongest use case I have at the moment. So with the Georgian government, they actually intend to become totally paperless. Um, in various areas, um, especially in, in transport. And, um, and there we look actually at the moment um, to, to provide them a platform where they can build on their services where actually you, as a, as a citizen, you go to the government, you do exactly the same process as you, as you know. You take a picture, they take your, your credentials, but then actually they, they put it on your personal identifier. And, um, and, and, and by proving it and by having this proof on the blockchain, it's actually, it's, it's tamper proof. So nobody else, uh, when you go and travel, if you use transportation or if you have to share data, um, it's automatically, the, the, the counterparties don't even have to access your data. They automatically see um, because the blockchain is tamper proof that, that actually, yes, this is um, a citizen of, and this is, and they just get, get, get the validation without actually entering your data. And this is something now we, we, we're trying to, to build and we, we, we're now um, elaborating in terms of other business use cases. Uh, sorry. <laughs> um, we have various areas because I think it's, if we, if we solve that issue with the, the digital identity, I think um, we have, we, there, there can be built many, um, many business models around that, um, that data model. And especially for enterprises, it will be very interesting because most of the enterprises, and this is also a bit the trend that we see now, it's, it's probably the moment more cloud-based, but a lot of the enterprises, they actually, um, they don't even want to own your data. So, um, they also happy if if it's just uh, if they can actually just access the data they need. You give the permission. You can even set the terms um, with with smart contracts that's on a blockchain. Set the terms and say like, okay, for this data, uh, you actually have to your your telco. You have to store it for two years. 
for two years and afterwards you, you won't be able to access that data anymore. They don't have to store it anyway because it's um, it's in the, within the network. And um, models like this it's in, are actually are actually within uh, within any any business um, any business models. In the government, as I mentioned, it's digital ID. We have civic records, we have licenses, we have certificates, we have awards. In travel, we mentioned uh, there, we are highly engaged now with car sharing memberships. Um, probably to, to what we heard before, the new model is, is as I mentioned, it's not only that you have different application or you combine these application um, in that model, these applications are still owned by someone, by a company, by Uber, by whoever, by by um, Lime, and, and 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 so forth. Um, in the future, when we talk about a decentralized autonomous organization, it's actually you can even be part or member of this um, of this application and recreator if you if you're part of the blockchain. And this is also. Once we, we reach the point um, of decentralization, I mean, that's Cardano will belong to everybody. And I think that's then, then we are entering really the new economy. Um, and uh, yeah, probably certain questions we have today um, will be solved automatically. Thank you. That uh, thanks a lot, Eva, for that uh, introduction. Um, I would suggest that we just start Was with it from my side. That uh, works, works. Um, I suggest we ask, we answer you, uh, we check your questions first for Cardano, and then we we take the ones from um, Moby. So we, I think we had a kind of more generic question, Eva, about Cardano, um, how that compares to first and uh, second generation blockchains. Uh, I guess you know. So the question was about security. I assume that you know how is how is Cardano doing versus Bitcoin. Uh, I don't know if you if you can kind of relate a little bit on that question first. Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, now we can. Okay. Good. Um, so um, what we, I mean, the first, the first um, aspect which I mentioned, uh, which I mentioned before, is like we we are proof of stake. That means um, we actually have a different consensus algorithm. Proof of work, Bitcoin and Ethereum. They actually, if if you know it a bit, you you had to um, run through really heavily computer. You needed computer power in order to 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 come to consent to to validate blocks. And our blocks are actually validated by, by a new consensus uh, mechanism. And something that really distinguishes us from probably all the blockchains are that we are very much scientific driven. So we work with a lot of universities. Um, we have this peer review, which you know, um, which is very common in, in academia. So before we store programming, uh, we actually first um, let it reviewed by, by academia and, and by experts. And then we start programming. So that's probably one aspect. Then the sustainability aspect. Um, also, in, you want to create an entire ecosystem. And this is also a part why we have this Atala Prism. We don't only think of the blockchain itself. We think of, OK, what is needed in action for such a, a new ecosystem to thrive? And um, the technology is not always in, in, in like the most um, important aspect. It's it's the use case actually, and we want to bring those use cases um, to life. We also have um, like projects in Africa. We have a project with the United Nations where um, we give out funds for, for actually good projects that, uh, that are now possible. And from a technology point of view, we really try to come up with, with a tech stack that is also unique. Um, like, what will come uh, like within the next few months or even weeks is we, we have an own, um, let's say, um, programming language, uh, Plutus, that's more for developer, that they uh, can actually build on the Cardano blockchain. But then we also have Marlo, which is a, a, just a drag and drop tool for anybody, for any enterprise who doesn't really know how a smart contract works. And it's like creating your own website. It's like if you want to, 
um, create your own um, blockchain project and uh, based on a smart contract, you just you can do it by yourself. And so I think in in summary, it's really that that we look at the tech, we validate before before we develop, and there we have very high uh, very high ambition. Um, probably another one is yeah, we're very inclusive. This is also um, one of the I think we have the biggest community or one of the biggest communities in the blockchain field, which is really amazing. And and they they are proactively helping us to to evolve the protocol. And um, yeah, and, and the other aspect is, is then more just in, in sustainability that we really try to to make a difference there too, and and come up with much more efficiency, scalability, and um, like yeah, make, make this entire blockchain actually more more scalable. Yeah, could could you elaborate a little bit on sustainability? You know, kind of we had a question around that. Uh, mm -hmm. What what does that mean in your terms? So one aspect of sustainability is really the, the new consensus algorithm that actually we, you don't use. We have kind of a, a, a consensus algorithm which is not based on computer power. Mm -hmm. And we have like very, um, very smart mechanisms how we can be as um, like, let's say, how we can have as much as transactions as possible to, to the least um, usage of energy, let's say, in a very, very broad summary. Yeah, yeah. And the second aspect is, is more um, that we really work with institutions, uh, as mentioned, in, in, with the United Nations, but also we have projects in Africa where we actually, we not only want to give access to, let's say, um, unbanked people to banks, because we believe it's not only banks that are necessary, um, but they need to have actually access to to those solutions that that are just normal for us, um, which they don't have. And and we actually, with this blockchain, we try to with with our projects, we try to give them the access to and and certain utilities they they don't have at the moment. Very good. Thanks a lot, David. There's two more questions. Uh, one is, um, you know, you mentioned a couple of use cases uh, for secure identities. Um, a question was about how uh, we would use that for patient dossier. How you would see that? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, as long as it's it's encrypted, you can use it for anything, right? Because it's not. Um, I mean, it's you own the data, and it's actually it's it would be very positive because I former before I worked at Cardano, we also I worked on a project for MS patients. And we were happy that we had access to a database with a lot of information about patients. We didn't care about who the patients are, but we got a lot of information. And thanks to that information, we were able to build um, actually an, 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 um, an intelligent um, tool based on machine learning, uh, which can really take on so many data from you and, and compare that and, and give you the best treatment. And that's just one use case. And if you go one step further in, in the terms of data monetization, what is also possible in the future is that you actually think of you have a lot of a huge record of your, your um, medicine, your health data, actually. You can also sell that. <laughs> that sounds now a bit weird, but actually if, if a Rush or, or a bigger pharma company, they, they do research and developments, they need actually data from patients. And um, in order to do that, they can just reach out and say like, hey, we need actually someone who's female, um, who is between 20 and 30, um, who has this and this and this characteristics. Would you share the data with us? It's going to be on an anonymous basis and we pay you for that. And since you have that all in your own digital vault or wallet, you can actually allow them access and get paid for it. That's like one of the cases, but there are like many similar ones. I think the first argument is really get better intelligence. And the second one is, is related to data monetization that you get. And for the companies, it's, I think it's, it's good. It's nice too. It's, it's much easier to, to get to such data. Thanks a lot, Deva. Um, so we have a, a few questions. I would like to continue with uh, Tram for you. Uh, we got a couple of questions around some standards, Tom and, and, and others, which I think you know much better as we. So uh, if you uh, could maybe elaborate on these questions uh, that we got from Mitos and Amir. Yes, um, I don't think I need to read out the questions, correct? People can, can read it. Uh, but, but regarding to standards, 
uh, we uh, each working group we have two co-chairs and the co-chairs are made up of members from our community and then the mobi staff um, has uh, we have a technical lead we have a working group lead and we have a fellow and together the five of them even before launching uh, the working group uh, do extensive research uh, to see what standards out uh, out there what uh, what publications have have uh, there been regarding the, the use cases that they're interested in and then uh, from there uh, they designed the project and the use cases uh, so we don't have enough staff to reinvent the wheels we don't want to reinvent the wheel because at the end of that we just have a garage full of wheels and and no no car uh, to go anywhere with that um, i hope that answered the first questions um, and then the second question uh, is about the uh, VID standard. Um, uh, yes, it's is, is uh, similar to uh, distributed identities. Uh, when we call it a vehicle ID, we are not just limiting it to uh, the car. Uh, it's actually for all vehicles, uh, including scooter, bicycle, motorbike, uh, and, and drone, um, and, and uh, delivery trucks. Um, <clears throat> and, um, we are about to uh, launch a Mobi European chapter, um, which a uh, technical lead that we just hired is based in Germany. And uh, that, uh, along with that, we are hoping next year to also launch a working group on uh, GDPR and California privacy uh, issues around IDs and what data should be available and not uh, available. And then I think the third question here is about our platform, um, how scalable it is. Uh, right now, the Zootopia platform, uh, we have it uh, in beta uh, version. One is iOS and one is Android, and uh, it's built on Hyperledger for, uh, for right now, and we are uh, wanting to also include other uh, blockchain, uh, other chains also. And uh, from the testing that we've done so far, it's about 200 uh, transactions per second. Um, and it's, uh, I think it's enough for what we're trying to do for now. As the technology mature, it will become uh, much faster. Uh, I think I answered all questions, correct? There's one magic question, which is scalability, right? Uh, obviously, you know, we're transacting today a lot on these blockchains now with IoT and, and other kind of like dimensions coming into this. I think the transaction volumes obviously could, could ma massively increase. And and that's the you know the question is where do you see limitations there right? So I'm not a technologist. Uh, that's not going to be something that I can answer. But maybe the the panel next, uh, Baska could um, could answer that uh, uh, for me if I can reserve that for the panel next. Okay, good. Okay, very good. Um, do you see working in connection with? Okay, there's a couple of there's a, one more question about vehicle ID. Let me just read that through. I guess several groups are working on standardizing separately. Do you see how, how such ID system going to be? Several ID system would exist or going to be only one standard rule established. So I get to saying, uh, if we're gonna have that single magic um, ID. Um, I, I don't think so. I think uh, there might be different uh, type of IDs for different ecosystem. I think the key here is that uh, there has to be a way to be able to communicate from one ecosystem to the next. Yes. Um, yeah. Interoperability. So are we going to have the same which uh, Evangelos told us that we're going to have an aggregated ID of all IDs of all IDs? Um, I, that, again, I'm not a technologist, so maybe the next panel can answer that question. Okay, <laughs> very good. Okay, thanks a lot, uh, Fram. So I would suggest uh, we, we're kind of one minute ahead of schedule, which is great. So I will uh, pass over to Dennis, who's going to introduce the panelists and also what we're going to talk about. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Mauro. Um, yeah, I'm very very good uh, presentations uh, so far and now we come to a more interactive section with the with the panelists and i'm very very glad to welcome with me tonight um or today uh, on one side uh, uh, uh Bashkar. i will not even try to <laughs> it on your on your on your last name 
uh, Babraska is professor uh, for electronical and computer engineering at the University of uh, Southern California. Is calling in from from uh, from California today as well. Same as well is uh, Chris Ballinger, the CEO of Moby, uh, as well from Los Angeles, joining us here. And then we have two Swiss representatives on one side, Vitus Amam, um, who I know already from the old days, uh, from Monetasa, who is now a, a senior advisor for digital transformation at the Swiss Federal System, which is our main public transport provider in, in Switzerland. And, um, uh, and then uh, we have Stefan Mignon, who is head of the Adnovum, uh, incubator and Novo is a leading uh, software house in in Switzerland and he is as well board member of car dossier which is one of these platforms for used cars uh, that we have here uh, very glad to have you all here um, and as I said the, the topic is data monetization um for the new economies of movement or the new economies of mobility first of all and we had that already in the presentations uh, a little bit what are these new economies of movement i think we first before we talk about more monetization of the data we need to explore a little bit on that topic so my first question vitus goes to you um the spb the Swiss Federal Railway Systems is a traditional player, an incumbent in that area. And just to get for all our international guests a little bit the uh, to um, and relationship here. I mean, Switzerland and Japan are the biggest railway system users in in the world uh, by as well kilometers and distances that you travel within uh, 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 based on the population and. Um, now, of course, the incumbent becomes a very important role because you are the uh, public transport company here. And what is your vision on the new economies of movement? Well, thank you for the flowers. Uh, we are probably in Switzerland uh, a bigger player in public transport, but public transport only accounts for roughly 20% of uh, total mobility. So uh, we have to put that in perspective. And I would also uh, like to start with putting the new economy into perspective because we have already quite some threats and opportunities pointed to us uh, in the current situation. Basically, mobility is an ever growing customer need. Since mankind has started moving around, we keep enlarging our radius of movement, both for commuting as well as for leisure purposes. I assume that the current contraction due to the pandemic will only have a temporary effect because it's a mega trend which, uh, which we see since uh, centuries, basically. Having said that, uh, it poses also the biggest threat to uh, how are we going to move around all these masses of people, especially if all of them want to travel at the same time. Just imagine, uh, looking at the picture Evan Evangelos showed at the beginning, how many scooters, bikes, uh, or micro shuttles, you need to replace only one underground carriage and add those to the already cramped streets uh, we see nowadays. Therefore, the new economy needs to be much more a clever economy. And as we strongly believe that we need to combine all kinds of mobility services into this sort of clever web of uh, mobility services. If I look at the narrow space of public transport, which you mentioned is quite advanced in Switzerland, um, we have by and large achieved it. If a customer wants to travel from one public transport station to another, anywhere in Switzerland, she can do this with one single ticket, independently of how many of the 250 transport companies in Switzerland are involved in this journey. The biggest disruption we see for the new economy is, is obviously the advent of um, autonomous cars. Uh, we do not know when they come, how they come, but we are absolutely sure that they will disrupt our way of moving around and much more, or the way where we live, how we live, probably in a way as did the cars when they replaced the horse carriages. Many experts foresee a huge increase actually in traffic volumes. 
So our infrastructure might barely swallow that uh, increase of traffic. Therefore, again, clever management and capacity utilization will be key. You will not be able to afford autonomous cars driving around with just one passenger as cars do uh, nowadays. So mixing and matching millions of customers with tens of thousands of autonomous shuttles and cars and whatever there will be, will be quite a challenging task. As SBB is today the backbone of the public transport, the opportunity we see will be to become it in the future new mobility as well. The threat actually is just to miss out this opportunity and leave it to one of the global tech giants as, as Evangelos mentioned it in his uh, speech. Therefore, working hard on best customer experience is the key challenge for us uh, nowadays. Okay. Well, um, Chris, you as C CEO from the uh, Mobility Open Blockchain Initiative, Mobi, um, what, is, what is your vision on, on these, um, or what's your understanding of, of the key challenges and uh, opportunities of the uh, future ecosystems uh, of movement. So let me um, maybe uh, say two things about the, the ecosystems. Uh, one is the, the ecosystems that we're talking about is, is, uh, are uh, a convergence of existing ecosystems of legacy players in different industries uh, coming together uh, and mixing and matching in entirely new ways. And I, I, one example is uh, uh, this new mobility is a, uh, is a mix of uh, the communications uh, of, of data, uh, of traditional mobility players, uh, and even uh, of infrastructure operators, right? Coming together in this ecosystem to, uh, uh, to uh, make better use uh, uh, of the assets that are there and their, their, their various strengths. Uh, the second thing about the ecosystems is it's a, uh, a monetization ecosystem. It's a transaction ecosystem. Uh, this this notion that uh, you know blockchain uh, allows you to uh, have secure identities, DIDs, and uh, uh, combine that with uh, with 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 AI and IoT, and suddenly you have uh, things and mobile things in the case of, of vehicles that have the ability uh, to uh, to communicate with. And more importantly, to transact with other things, other vehicles, infrastructure, uh, in, in in ways that are wholly new, uh, and uh, open up uh, an enormous amount of value because it can monetize things which are today not monetizable. Uh, data being, uh, you know, the, the the one that we're talking about most today, but also infrastructure itself. Uh, you know, the the vast majority of the world's road infrastructure is is unmonetizable. Uh, you know, with the with a, the minor exception of, of freeway uh, tolling, uh, uh, most city infrastructure, road infrastructure, cannot be monetized because it's more expensive uh, to charge for it, uh, or just technically impossible to charge for it with existing technology. Uh, and this this notion of of connected vehicles uh, with digital IDs, uh, enhanced GPS, the ability to have two way communications in and out of the cars, uh, will open that up for marginal cost pricing, for congestion pricing, uh, for urban tolling, uh, for enforcing green zones, uh, for uh, uh, carbon uh, emissions pricing, pollution pricing, and uh, uh, drone airspace pricing, on and on and on and on. And so it's tens of trillions of dollars of new opportunity. Yeah. Well, Baska, you from from the academic view on it, I mean, what, what are the kind of, I mean, you probably look even, even a step further <laughs> as uh, as uh, as the near future i mean what 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 are the things that you see on the long run so i think if you look at uh, <clears throat> vehicles in particular um they've really transformed from being primarily mechanical platforms to computational platforms they're data driven they have hundreds of uh, microcomputers on board and uh, powerful computers to process the data for uh, autonomy they are networked um, increasingly with you know, more capable uh, V2V communications as well as 5G. And so as you're seeing the shift in what a vehicle itself is, um, these vehicles are themselves becoming more capable of offering digital goods and services and consuming these digital goods and services. This is you know, sensor data, 
um, software to process that data. It is computation ability, it's storage. And um, the other thing that's happening, I think at the same time is vehicles are going to become much more flexible in their use. Uh, certainly they will carry passengers, but also become increasingly delivery vehicles, uh, both themselves, but maybe as launching boards for uh, or launching pads for UAVs. Um, they become uh, portions of the supply chain in a very flexible manner. They could um, you know, be used in an on-demand um, basis. They can become entertainment uh, platforms as well. And so as you look at all of these sort of the convergence of the digital technologies with uh, the vehicular domain, um, I think there's all kinds of new interactions between vehicles and vehicles and infrastructure that's going to drive uh, some of these you know, questions of data monetization. It's what people are also in terms of you know, autonomous driving right now, there's a lot of focus on the single vehicle, but there's a shift towards thinking about collaborative autonomy. What does it mean to kind of interact with the other vehicles on the road and with the infrastructure? Uh, and I think the other trend is the, uh, or, or perhaps the opportunity there is for cities to really work with um, mobility providers, with uh, vehicle manufacturers to, to think through the implications of this new economy in terms of sustainability, the environment, uh, traffic, uh, but also helping to grow the local economy and the businesses, which are also becoming digital and data driven. And so how does um, sort of the mobile infrastructure play a role in that. I think all of these are, are trends and, and uh, opportunities. I think a very good point that you, that you say there, and especially that vehicles, because they're moving around, are as well data producers. And I mean, um, probably not in sunny California you experienced that, but here I think we had during the pandemic uh, a little bit of problem with the weather forecast because we just didn't have the data from all these airplanes over the Atlantic that were telling us if a storm is coming or not. Now, an existing platform which just recently launched in this ecosystem, and it's probably less about mobility services at the moment, but it has the, has the possibility of the future, but it is a platform that is connecting the data uh, around mobility and around used cars is the Car Dossier Initiative, isn't it, uh, Stefan? So um, it's an ecosystem, I think 22 members are now participating from various disciplines, uh, a lot of incubators, but as well new players, startups that are coming together under that dossier. Perhaps you can tell us a little bit about that existing or that ecosystem that you just launched. Um, yes, thank you, Dennis. Um, yes, Car Dossier um, is a distributed blockchain-based platform supporting a complete business ecosystem around cars. And uh, the heart of the platform is the dossier of the car, which is containing all the relevant record of a car during the whole life cycle, like import, like registration, services, change of ownership, accident, and so on. And the part of the ecosystem are uh, importers, insurances, garages, mobility providers, road authorities, and road federal office, which contribute to the dossier and then using it. So it's not only startup, but it's really established enterprise and player in, in, uh, in Switzerland. And um, the question, why blockchain? Actually, um, if you analyze a business ecosystem, you are always faced with the following uh, three challenges. First one is the lack of trust between the participants. Um, second is a bad quality of data. And the third is the frictions during uh, cross company processes. And uh, this is exactly the added value that blockchain brings. And uh, this is a single point of truth. This is a data hub role. And this is a catalyst for automation of cross company business. And uh, we use exactly those blockchain features to build the car dossier as a digitization platform for the complete car industry in Switzerland. And not only for the second hand uh, market, but really for any kind of transaction within this ecosystem. Thank you very much. Um, Vitus. In Switzerland, we have another ecosystem on mobility, which is called the, the Swiss Pass. Um, the key to mobility and leisure is what it's what it's called. Basically, I think it, it is a card or an account, a wallet, you, you name it, 
um, that, that you have that gives you access to the 250 different public transport uh, companies uh, that we have. But the interesting thing is, um, and the federal railway assistance is a major um, participant in there and sponsor from that, um, of course. Um, but you have exactly decided against blockchain technology uh, when you when you launched that ecosystem. Uh, can you tell us a little bit why and what's the reason behind it? Are you muted? Thank you. Actually, we have not decided against the blockchain uh, because the system was already there. Funny enough, the first general abonnement, as we call a kind of a travel card um, with a yearly flat fee, was launched in Switzerland in 1898, so more than 120 years ago. Uh, that was already valid for 15 different railway companies at the time. Then in the wake of the green movement in the 80s, the legal requirements were established to enable that principle of the one fair one ticket, which I explained in my uh, answering the last question. Now, the governance of this system of the Swiss bus and its management evolved obviously with the technology over the time. So uh, having uh, exchanged paper copies uh, and then uh, telex and then faxes and whatsoever, um, uh, it, it evolved in a sort of a consortium. So in, in, as it would, would be named in the DLT speak. It, it is actually a cooperative of, of those mentioned 250 public transport companies who run the system. The cooperative, is it called now the Swiss Pass Alliance, it has charged SPB to develop and run the platform on behalf of all the members. I guess around the time when Satoshi Nakamoto wrote his famous white paper, the Alliance drafted the principles for the Swiss Pass. Um, today, more than four and a half million or more than half of all people living in Switzerland are subscribed to this card, as you mentioned, as well as the digital identity, which goes with it, which is a very centralized identity, I have to say at this point. So instead of rebuilding the existing platform, which serves already 100% of the public transport, we now focus on adding other mobility services to the platform such as car sharing, bike and scooter sharing and parking in order to provide our customers with a mobility experience as seamless as possible and to be prepared for the event of autonomous vehicles. And being organized in the form of cooperative, we have a kind of decentralized system, at least when it comes to governance already in place. Thank you. I think that's it gives a good view, and especially as well with the, with the presentation paired with Angolos, what these future ecosystems uh, or what the existing ones are look like. And it is all about interoperability. It is all about um, identity as well, and it is about uh, you know offering goods and uh, and service. And at a later stage, but at the moment, I think it's really about just plugging existing systems together and exchanging the data between each other. And I think, uh, Mauro, we have a question that goes into that direction. Yeah, exactly. Uh, quite interesting here is, uh, I think uh, somebody is asking that, uh, obviously we're gonna share a lot of data and obviously there's uh, some competition between you know, different brands, which obviously don't wanna share the data they capture with each other. Uh, so, and I think the question was, you know, should we have digital identity for a service, right? Or should we kind of like, how do we secure that uh, allowing to kind of capture the data, distribute the data, but keep it uh, in the borders of uh, competition? I don't know who, who's best to answer that. Uh, Stefan, I think. Yeah, so I can just give an answer regarding so okay, so what regarding this this um, this this use case so the business ecosystem so the topics of identity is coming uh, always really on the top of the priority and one of the main uh, uh, challenge to to solve and uh, um, Eva spoke about uh, self sovereign identity and this is exactly what we are doing now implementing in in um, in car dossier. And uh, we use self sovereign identity, whose goal is to give back to users the control of their data and identity. And so um, the data owners get full control over the data. And uh, the data, the identity, so the person or, or an organization that owns the data rights, is in control of who, when, and why someone may access it. 
And this means that this is exactly important in such an ecosystem to 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 give this to to this to, this, to implement this kind of instrument to, to be able to define exactly who is um, may who may have access to that kind of data. Mm -hmm. But is, you know, just a quick question, maybe on that one. You know, clearly it could happen that nobody wants to share it, right? And they're going to start, uh, you know, preventing others to see. How would you kind of come across that problem? Do you somewhat anonymize the data, or you know, how can it be shared uh, rather than uh, you know, commonly? I think that the owner of the data is um, allowed to say he doesn't want to share it. And it's it, and this is a fundamental right, and mm -hmm. I think this is exactly what we want to to provide. Uh, in contrary to global um, provider like Facebook or Google, or where you don't exactly know how your data have been uh, used, mm -hmm. and the idea of Cardos here is exactly to have such a granularity of the data that you can say what come from a record of a of a car, which which kind what kind of data you want to to share and which not. Okay. So you would say there is as well a right for anonymous travel, huh? I think yes. Yeah. I think we just, that is as well a problem that, that we have with the public transport as well from time um, that people just don't want to tell everybody where they were going, you know? It is indeed. Uh, and um, that is also one of the reasons why we see the digital, or the digital identity is one of the key cornerstones uh, of uh, blockchain technology or where blockchain technology or DLT uh, applications can help most. It's also when we at the SBB looked at blockchains, we, we developed with all the divisions about 30 to 40 different use cases, potential use cases. We did five to 10 proof of concept or pilots, but in the end it boiled down to two main factors which are missing in the ecosystem. First is the identity, and secondly, is a uh, trustworthy digital uh, digital money or digital currency. Mm. So uh, uh, we have all of that digital francs. Well, it is coming, but you have no reach. So that's that's a problem. You have all those different ecosystems, like the mobility ecosystem, uh, and I personally do not believe that there will be an identity for a specific ecosystem. There will be an identity for things and persons that will uh, which will be used in all kind of ecosystems. There will be money and it needs to be a, a trusted money so uh, that people know, be it the Swiss franc, be it the dollar, be it the euro, and uh, no fancy other stuff, which will be needed on a digital platform in order that people will engage uh, with it. I see that there is a lot of movement going on in the, in the terms of currency, be that uh, run by or led by Facebook or by uh, some central banks. Uh, that will definitely help. But we at SP also decided that the identity part will be something we want to uh, engage ourselves. And uh, we are very much following the, those um, developments of the SSI standards run by uh, W3C, where we see a great potential in future. Uh, Mitos, one question came up, uh, you know, Swiss ID, uh, do you think that there's potential that, to move that into a more blockchain-based form? Uh, the current system, which is uh, developed and, and where the uh, the law has been drafted, is rather building on federated IDs. So uh, at the time when the when the, the legal framework was built or was in in, in construct under construction, um, that was kind of the most advanced uh, proven technology which is there. So as we can see, the blockchain-based identity systems, uh, which you also have seen from Eva. Um, they are still under development. Those uh, those uh, uh, W3C standards, which I mentioned, they are basically all uh, for reference, for comments. So it might take another uh, three or four years until we really can see that blockchain-based uh, DIDs uh, will be um, solidified enough uh, mm. or proven enough that that can uh, form the basis of those identities, I guess. Maybe I can just add something about this. I think regarding suicide is uh, the, the question, the, the fundamental question is not about the technology behind. 
so if it's uh, based on blockchain or not. The question is that, do we want to use uh, a distributed uh, um, uh, system like self-sovereign identity who make us, uh, to make uh, the issuer not centralized like Swiss ID is defined now, but to have then another way to, to, pr to, 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 um, to, to create the identity and to prove them. And for that, it's more about the questions, what is a business model from such Swiss ID than really what is the technology behind, mm -hmm. in my opinion. Mm -hmm. We talked already a lot about the, 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 the opposite side from now, these decentralized systems that we were talking about and the beauty of, I mean, having a, having a providers for, for uh, identity, having providers for the cash flow, having providers for, for the transportation, and then all melting them together in kind of ecosystems and make them into a rentable way. Of course, then you have the other sides, which Evangelos uh, showed us as well. And probably you, uh, Bashkar and, and Chris, you uh, just the closest to Silicon Valley. And of course, it would be interesting to understand how, how you see, what, what, what kind of strategies you see from those players and how will there, will there be opportunities and will there be threats and what do we need to watch out for? I, I mean, I would say that a lot of um, the response to blockchain technology is both reactive and cautious. Um, for many companies, decentralization is a threat in some ways to the way they traditionally uh, kind of, you know, essentially own a lot of uh, data and are able to exercise that and monetize it. Um, but also, it's confusing, actually, to go to a decentralized uh, world, right? How, how would you monetize a decentralized uh, system? Who's going to pay for um, the components of it? Now, there are exceptions. Uh, IBM, of course, has invested a lot in enterprise uh, blockchain as an example. Uh, Facebook has uh, its own plans with respect to blockchain. There are various cloud platforms looking at blockchain as a service offerings. Um, but I think, you know, it's still kind of, there's a level of skepticism and uh, perception that this is both confusing and perhaps a threat. Um, but I think something that is happening is there is a shift, a very perceptible shift in a focus on privacy of data. You look at uh, Apple in particular, making a lot of uh, moves towards uh, positioning itself as really uh, emphasizing the privacy of data. And at the same time, new technologies like uh, federated learning, which allow you to train neural networks on individual um, data without actually directly uh, moving that data to a cloud uh, point. And so there's other ways in which I think uh, decentralization and uh, uh, data monetization might happen in, in ways that are privacy preserving, not necessarily using blockchain technology uh, but I, I think these are some of the trends that I see. Mm -hmm. Chris, I think you're in mute. Can we come not hear you? Nope. I think your mic disappeared. <laughs> No, at least I can't not hear you. I don't know about the others. Yeah, okay. This is a pity we will try. But I think, um, yeah, as, as you said, I mean, at the end, it becomes a little bit, for, and from my perspective, it becomes a little bit into, an, um, into a battle. I mean, I think we will still see a battle of ecosystems. Huh? So on one side, it will be these uh, centralized uh, solutions that will make it very easy from a, from, a, from a customer experience and from an usability, et cetera, that becomes quite interesting. I mean, we, we, when we look at Asia, we see all these, uh, these, uh, these super apps, as they call them now, you know, that are pure marketplaces and everything is put together from finance, from public transport, from uh, payment solutions, from insurance solutions, <laughs> is in one in one platform and provided like on a on a nice table to to, to consumers now that is that is quite that on the other side of course we have all these in traditional providers which uh, as you say have their uh, current business models and they are of course at threat in, in in losing the connection to the customer or have a new intermediary in between and um and i think that is where the distributed 
technology, maybe blockchain, maybe this muted ledger um, uh, technology, may it be uh, decentralized databases connected by APIs together. Uh, that could be a good answer to these uh, to decentralized solutions. And I think the Mobi, solu uh, the Mobi platform or the Mobi initiative goes exactly into that direction, Chris. Is it? Can you hear us? I uh, seems not to be hearing us as well. <laughs> so it seems that we have totally. Can we, can we ping him on WhatsApp, maybe? Yeah, yeah. Let's 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 let's, tr let's try that. Okay, but um, at the end, I think um, it still needs some kind of uh, of. Um, centralized aspects, even though you have decentralized solutions and and the uh, the governance behind such networks is is a, is a key thing. And I think in Cardossier and in and the SPB and perhaps you, uh, Pascal, know, know as well certain models, how could such an governance of decentralized systems, decentralized platforms that enable the monetization of uh, mobility, how could that look like? What kind of examples have you observed on the market? I, I can speak to some work we've done at USC. Um, we have been looking at community marketplaces for IoT data and working with the city of Los Angeles and other uh, local government as well as industry partners uh, to explore this question. And um, one way governance could work, depending on you know what what the uh, platform and the applications are, is to somehow connect it to the existing governance systems that we have for our uh, cities, our counties, uh, and perhaps you know in, in places like County of Los Angeles is 88 different cities, so there's already a pretty robust uh, decentralized governance in some sense, and so um, I, I think one possibility is to connect these types of uh, data marketplaces, particularly to the extent that the applications are intended to benefit the community um, to our existing kind of political governance mechanisms to some extent. And I think uh, th there's some possibilities there to be explored. Okay. Well, I think interesting enough, we see two developments at the same time. Because if we look at the economy as it is today, especially in mobility, we, we do live in a very decentralized uh, economy. I mean, we have the cars on its own, we have the garages, we have the, the, the car drivers, we have the, the public transport providers, we have the micro mobility providers. I cannot imagine a more decentralized way of, of, of working together. And that's only that's only the horizontal view. You have a lot of verticals uh, that goes for insurances and everything down down this path. Even more so, even more so. And then we have the then we have the, this movement of centralization on platforms, which some some markets like information or news or so have already progressed quite a lot or via the social media. And we, we see the movement again into decentralization based on uh, digital platforms. So I think we are currently in, in, in a very volatile situation and I would not dare to make any prediction where the, the, the markets are, are going to. However, what we see is that what we've learned in the, in, the, in the traditional decentralized world, that you need to find a consortium, that you need to find a, govern, a governance, uh, be that in, in, in a kind of a um, cooperative way, be that with uh, lead companies or whatsoever, I assume that those models will also re-emerge in those digital decentralized uh, platforms. And, and you need to kind of share the cost of developing those uh, platforms as well as the benefits of it. So if I, if I look at the, at the Swiss Plus example, which we have seen, the principle is that all the tickets which, which um, uh, affect more than one transport company are basically sold by this cooperative and then distributed uh, according the, the measured um, ways which, which uh, people did uh, with these tickets. Uh, it is a complex system. It will not be much easier when we have it all digitalized because we just need all the information in, in, uh, in comparable formats, which uh, is quite a challenge. And that's also the question which we were discussing when it comes to the MOBI initiative. What kind of standards will there be? Will there be global standards? Will there be 
national standards or continental standards, whatever they are, there is to manage that complexity. So Chris, yes, standards. I think uh, that's uh, another key thing. So governance is one thing, consortium, important, uh, that everybody should platform, participate on the platform, should be a part of this consortium and bring in their, their aspects to make sure uh, they're not cannibalizing themselves in their in their core businesses, but at the end, it's as well, uh, you know, the consortium there needs as well be a governance on standards, and I think that's exactly what the initiative is about, isn't it? It's uh, it's partly about standards, but it's partly about uh, building the the platforms and the rest of the plumbing, so the standards can be used in a in a, a business ecosystem, uh, a, a shared environment for sharing data for sharing services. And I, I, I want to link this to the previous question about uh, Silicon Valley, because I think it, it's, a, it's a really important distinction. I think Silicon Valley's uh, competitive advantage for the last 20 years has been scraping data uh, off of other apps and putting it in proprietary data silos. I think the, this technology uh, erodes that competitive advantage. And it also is something that I think uh, the rest of the world uh, is, in, in some sense, maybe better positioned than Silicon Valley to do uh, because uh, Silicon Valley isn't particularly good at, at cooperation uh, or, or uh, co-opetition. Uh, so I think uh, you know the kind of environments that we're talking about today, the kind of environments that Mope is trying to create with its ecosystem, with uh, its standards, with the open mobility network uh, is really the, the kind of environment that undermines the Silicon Valley model, uh, enables a, a different business model that's more inclusive, particularly for other types of organizations in other parts of the world. Uh, and uh, it's, it's, it, but it requires plumbing first, uh, which is where this standard in community building uh, is, it, it comes in why it's so important. Yeah, perfect. Stefan, uh, your experience as being such a consortium across different parties, what is the things you would say, hey guys, if you if you want to build these kind of uh, new ecosystems or for mobility of movement that are decentralized, involve uh, different uh, competitive uh, and not not only competitive players, but as well players that that build together a. Uh, and, and, and joint value chain. I mean, we saw Evangelos uh, uh, example of uh, you, you pick a train, you go to a car, you have a bike and so on. I mean, these are vertical collaborations. These are virtual, vertical um, uh, uh, value chains. Um, but being a consortium, what would be the kind of recommendations you give to us? Um, watch out when you, when you want to build a network. Yeah, I think the... the... The governance part is really important, and it's something we had focused uh, from the beginning, beside uh, the technology part, and uh, just having the question: what is uh, uh, what is the legal form of such a consortium? Is is some is is the first question, for example. We have created an association, and uh, all the so that all the members are equal on it and have a right to this, and uh, this is. Uh, important to define what are the design principles and to build your governance on it. And this kind of, of equality uh, is really important. And uh, in, the, in the case of, uh, of, of, uh, of Cardos here, we have built this association. The association is in charge for building, financing the core platform. And, and this is a collaboration. And on top of this platform, the members can build their own uh, business model. And this is a, as a competition. And we can really live with that a really good competition because uh, there is some uh, big players uh, like uh, two, we have two major insurances who are competing on the, on the, on the market, but they are part of Cardos here because they are seen, the, the, they have a common interest to, to, to build this, this uh, common data and uh, the common layer to, to, to make this typical across company business ecosystems processes. And I think it's important to have the transparency and to be able after to, to really make the difference what is the core, what is specific. And uh, we also have so, uh, so cross company processes uh, we, we, want, we are going to, to, to build. So we are working now on the all immatriculation process of a car. So from, the, from, from buying a car, uh, have sending, um, 
uh, the, to get from the insurance certificate from the insurance and have to do how to get the vehicle registration card from the road authority and to get after uh, the the role uh, you you your uh, registration card of, of, of your, your your vehicle and this kind of uh, for this kind of process it's important to have a clear de uh, uh, definition what belong to the core processes and what belong after to the different um, uh, members. Excellent. So thank you very much. Chris, as co-organizer of that, uh, of, the, of this uh, event here, um, what's your conclusion on tonight? I think uh, what's, uh, what's wonderful about these types of events where so many uh, different parties from different backgrounds, different parts of the world, different industries come together uh, is it really highlights this this notion of convergence, and so maybe that's the the theme for the uh, for, for for the takeaway. Uh, it's convergence on so many levels, uh, starting with the technology. Uh, you know, this the con com combination of DLT and AI and IoT, and to a lesser extent, perhaps uh, edge computing and and five G and some others. Uh, this you know leading to vehicles uh, and things generally uh, having intelligence and. To, being able to participate increasingly autonomous in this, in this economic system, being able to transact with each other uh, in ways that open up uh, uh, many, many new business models uh, and open up, uh, release uh, things that can't be monetized today and open them up to monetization. Number two, geographies, uh, this convergence of really, uh, you know, efforts that are going on around the world, you know, are, our membership in Mobi is truly global. We're roughly evenly split, and the, uh, on the call today, I, you know, it's 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 Europe, Americas, Asia, uh, all, all contributing to this. Uh, cyber and physical, uh, the convergence of physical and 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 cyber things. Uh, uh, you know, the, the physical things are quickly becoming commodities. Uh, car companies are now data companies, right? Tesla is a data company is the most valuable manufacturer in the world. Uh, DIDs uh, uh, are the key to bringing the digital economics to the physical world. Uh, you, know, you might say that IoT turns products into services, but DIDs turn centralized monopoly services into efficient decentralized services, at least that's the, the hope. Uh, and maybe finally, industries, uh, this convergence of transportation, energy, communications, you know, together uh, the, this new economy of, of, of movement uh, is upwards of 20% of global GDP. Uh, so it's just an enormous uh, uh, revolution and, uh, and massive opportunity. Tens of trillions of dollars, uh, uh, tens of trillions of euros in new business opportunity to monetize this data and to unlock the stranded capital uh, that exists today. Very exciting. I personally think it's like exciting times that we are facing and that will come to us. Uh, uh, especially now that we really go into um, these benefits as well from, from decentralized uh, systems. And I'm a strong believer in, in market efficiencies that decentralized systems come over uh, centralized systems, although the centralized systems definitely have a key advantage in getting scale. And that's, that's, uh, that will be one of the biggest challenges that we have. I mean, we, we probably then invest too much time in governance and making it uh, happy for everybody. And believe me, we as here in Switzerland with our people democracy, we know exactly it always takes longer than, than it is. And sometimes you're just losing track in, in getting, getting at the end of real, real results. And um, I just hope we are uh, here in uh, sometimes faster now in, in really delivering uh, proper end-to-end -end solutions. But it will be exciting because we are now sh just shaping a new way of, of the economy uh, for the future. And, um, and I think it will be quite um, interesting to see what it is. I would like to thank everybody uh, for participating today. Uh, Eva Evangelos uh, Tram for the, the presentations to give us the insights. Uh, I think the presentations will be as well later on available, at least on the on the CVA uh, website. 
Again, please advertising, become a member of the CVA. There are quite interesting events that you that you that you see, not only these public ones, there are as well uh, events for members uh, that we that we're doing, at least as well from the Enterprise uh, Blockchain Working Group. I would like to thank my panelists, Vitus. Uh, Bashkar and, and Chris, uh, thanks to California as well to participate in this early morning session and for uh, Stefan um, and uh, Kevin as well for the, for the evening uh, sessions here. And of course, special thanks to Mauro, my co-chair in this working group. Thank Exciting you. times, isn't it? And again, for hosting it and following the questions. And um, yeah, so thanks for everybody. Have a great uh, evening and um, and uh, talk to you soon if one of, at one of our next events. Okay, thank you very much. Thank and you, bye-bye. Bye-bye.